My God lives, my God lives, my God lives. 
testified yes he's not there but you know what happened when two or three gather in his name he is there when two or three gather in his name our God is there and I believe as we gather in the name of the risen God in the name of the risen Christ, in the name of our risen Savior, He is coming. He is here. And I want you to declare that we, each one of us, who are gathered in His name, whether online or here in person, that we are going to encounter the risen God today. Somebody say, He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. And somebody say, He is here. He is here. He is here. You know, I'm not waiting for a future resurrection. He is already resurrected. And He is alive. one of us with your presence. May the glory of the latter temple be greater than the former. Lord, we are hungry for you. We're hungry for an encounter with you, God. Jesus, we make you the center. We make you the center of it all.
inside Roaring like a lion My God's not dead He's surely alive And he's living on the inside Roaring like a lion My God's not dead He's surely alive And he's living on the inside Roaring like a lion My God's not dead He's surely alive And he's living on the inside Roaring like a lion My God's not dead He's surely alive Surely alive and he's 
blood of Jesus. Just say, Jesus, drench me in your blood. Drench me in your love.
beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. And nothing can stand against. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. 
know, if somebody's walking and you call their name, they turn around. They respond to their name. You know, we've become so de sometimes desensitized to that term, call on the name of Jesus.
right now stand and be of great expectation. scriptures 1st Corinthians 15 says this moreover brethren I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you which also you received and in which you stand by which you also are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain we don't believe in vain for I delivered to you first all that which I received also that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas then by the twelve and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain present but some have fallen asleep the resurrection of Jesus Christ is documented over 500 people saw him and when Peter stood at the, at, after, the, after the Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit had come, and when he stood there and he preached the risen Christ, 3,000 people, nobody questioned whether Christ had been risen because there had been evidence and people had seen it. Christ is risen and that is the truth. Somebody say hallelujah. And after that he was seen by James and then by all the apostles then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time Paul the apostle says he saw on the sea on that road to Damascus I want to say something our encounters with our Lord Jesus Christ is in no way less we can expect with great expectation hallelujah verse 12 says this now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead how can some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead you know I heard this term and I thought it was a very funny term Christ makes us indestructible. For if we die, we live. Somebody say amen. What can be done to these mortal bodies? For if we die, we live. Hallelujah. Verse 20 says this, but now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruit, and after those who are in Christ at his coming. Because he lives we live and right before he was betrayed and right before he was crucified he instituted his supper his order of things one of us to become part of his body to partake of him and to join in the new covenant the covenant not of the lamb but of the lamb of God who alone is worthy Christ who is the head and that and 
we that which are the body. You know, right now as we participate of the Lord's Supper, I want every eye to be closed. I just want you to think of the righteousness that has been accounted to us through Jesus Christ. receive righteousness through rebirth into the body of Christ. Not by our deeds or acts. Not by our failings or anything our, which, our victories are we saved. We are saved by faith in the blood of the Lamb that was shed for us. And by the by faith on the one that was crucified died, buried, and rose again. Verse 28 says, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And who, he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the law of the Lord's body. We just want to examine ourselves. May we find Christ joy in the new covenant. There is hope in the new covenant. There is deliverance in the new covenant. There is healing in the new covenant. The past is gone and the new has come and we are a new creation in the new covenant. Somebody say amen. morning we thank you for what you're going to do in this place Lord yes. and what you already began you, started God. doing in this house we thank you for miracles Lord we thank you for signs and wonders even for, for people watching even as we celebrate the resurrection 
We thank you that same power. Let it start saturating us right now. The same glory which rose Jesus from the dead. Let it start saturating us even right now. take this time to give to the Lord as we celebrate Easter. It's a good day to give. Uh, you know, there are different ways to give. We can give by Capstone app. We can give by our website, capstone-church.org. Uh, we can give by uh, Crossway Giving. There's a new app for Crossway Giving. You can give by that. And um, so if you want more cash, you can do that. So, But there's no pressure to give. to hear testimonies. You know why? Because the, the, the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. When God does it once, He does it again. So you can always receive that and God will do for you. But, you know, more than anything, for me personally, uh, like from when God touched me, that was 1996, when I encountered the Holy Spirit in 1997. And, uh, Throughout the last 20, more than 24 years, have had the privilege of traveling to over 50 countries. I've seen, I've seen different miracles. You know, just like how many of you have seen miracles in your house? How many of you have seen financial miracles? Come on. How many of you believe in that? Amen. But you know what? Sometimes people love to hear that, and 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 I'm not, I'm not. We're not doing this just because we want you to give a. Uh, we want to give offering. That's not the reason. Why? Uh, why I'm I'm sharing this is because there was a season in my life where I stopped believing miracles. Let me be honest. I mean, you know, we just thought that natural. You know, you have faith, but you're not really believing for something supernatural. You know, faith is sometimes you have one plus one is two, or two plus two is four. You know, you add, you know, God's going to give you. And then if you work, you'll get. But a miracle is not that. Miracle is one plus one is ten. Hallelujah. Come on. It's a supernatural. So, uh, you know, uh, for me, this year, when, when this year started, I was believing for a miracle for, for a company. And, and uh, I took 21 days. I think it was just the end of Feb till March 19th to pray for that miracle. So while I was praying, I mean, when I say that, see, some of you know me, know like I'm crazy. You know, I'm, I'm really crazy. Like, but for a few years, I've not been. You know, I remember one of the pastors told me years back, you know, he said, you know what, you're crazy and I'm crazy. Another pastor, I remember preaching in Hong Kong, this is 2002, he said, you know what, you sound like Lester Simrod. But because I've been crazy for, I mean, crazy in believing for things. You know, I mean, that, that, that's supernatural. But somewhere the, along the line, I was, I'd lost that faith. You, know, you can just lose it because you just believe that, you know what, it, it, it's, it's, it's natural and you start working and you start getting things. And so it came to that place, you know. I was still fasting, I was praying, you know, I was, uh, but I didn't have that supernatural faith. You know, supernatural faith is when, when you know God is going to do it. It's not like there's somewhere. So I was praying for this in this 21 days and I was fasting and praying. And uh, I wrote, written on three points which I needed. And there was no natural way that those three things would happen. There's no way. There was no natural way. You know, I didn't have a solution. I didn't have a, a way. I mean, I, I mean, last few years, you know, I would have been thinking about how to get it happen. This, that, that wasn't. And I wrote down March 15th that these things would happen March 15th. And I confessed five scriptures. The first was, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. 
Second verse that I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippines 4.13. Third is Deuteronomy 8.18. God's given us the ability to create wealth. I believe God is a creator of wealth and he, so that he can establish his covenant. And the fourth was that Lord will pour out his rain in this season so that he will bless the work of our hands and we will not be lenders to, we will not be borrowers to nations, but we will be lenders. Amen. So I was confessing this, you know, I was confessing this and praying. So March 15th came and I had faith and I knew that there was not, it's not, it was not like 90% or when I have faith, it's like, I know that 100% it will happen. It was not 99.9%. And then for a couple of years, I've not seen that, you know. So March 15th happened. And Preeti had given a prophetic word in the December end, and in December end that March 15, there's going to be many financial miracles, you know. So I, 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 I was like believing that this was a supernatural miracle and it would happen. So March 15 came, it didn't happen. But you know what? March 17, March 20th, I didn't have a doubt. I said, you know what? I started thanking God. I never prayed after that, but I started thanking God for those miracles. And I started continuing to confess the word. And I said, you know what? It's already done. It's done in the spiritual, but it may not have happened in the natural. Hallelujah. After that, I didn't ask because you know what? If I asked after that, I didn't believe it was faith. But I just thank God that it's done. It's done in the supernatural, but it's going to happen in the natural. And still there was no way in the natural it would happen. And you know what? Whatever thought, ways I thought in the natural would be there, God closed all that. And last week, God opened up a supernatural way and bought more than everything it asked for. And yesterday we got everything. And I'll tell you one thing, it had to be God. But, you know, I know many people are praying and all that, which is, we all need to intercede and pray. But you know what? All of us also need to take responsibility for faith for our faith I mean there were seasons I didn't take it but there were a lot of seasons I did is this the biggest financial miracle we've seen no but you know what for after a few years for me this is something big because you know I've started believing for miracles you know and I know that I've written on March 15 that written on June 30th that what God wanted to do what God needs to do Whatever I wrote for March 15th, everything is done. Amen. See, listen, what I'm trying to say is whether you're believing God for, you know, whatever you're believing God for, whether it's 100 pounds, I fasted and prayed and I knew for new, when I say no, like there was no doubt that God wouldn't do it. You know, when people are asking me, you know what, I remember my mom asked me, I think 10 days back, oh, you know, you're praying for something, it's going, I said, it's happening, it's happening next week, you know. There's no way, I didn't have a way to happen. I, I mean, that is just a step of faith, you know. But I knew that it would happen. But there were seasons, like a couple of few years, you know, when people would ask me and, and I mean, like, I'm not trying to lie and I'm not trying to just put in faith, but like what I'm trying to say is, when you know a miracle has happened in the spirit, when you know a breakthrough has happened, you know by how you are acting, you don't have a doubt. See, that is what Abraham did. He called things into existence which was not. You know, and that's faith. When things are not there and you call that into existence. Listen, I want to close with this. For us, for the church, we want to be known as a people of faith. You know, I remember, you know, I was so, if suppose everything ends and everything finishes, you know, there are many things people can call you by. For me personally, I want to be known as a man of faith, that I've believed in Jesus. You know, and that is being a steward, you know, believe in Jesus. It's not about, so today when as you're giving, you can, we can give however way you want to give or even if you don't give, it doesn't matter. What matters is that when you're a son or a daughter, you want to be full of faith. Amen. So whatever your miracle is, it can be healing, it can be finances, it can be a job, it can be a visa. When you believe him, it's going to happen. And sometimes people say, you know what, why, why? that's faith. You know, so people want to see when you, faith is just believing it. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's thank him. Oh, Father, Lord, if you want a, if you want a miracle today, we're going to pray and we're going to close and we've got our Simon to come in and preach the word. 
What are your miracles if you're going to pray right now? Oh, Father, you said, Lord, in your word that your testimony, Lord, your testimony of what you've done is a spirit of prophecy. Even right now, I pray for everyone in this house and everyone watching who needs a miracle. Lord, we pray, even as they believe in you, that you came into the world, died for their sins, and broke every curse, broke every spirit of poverty, and then you rose again from the dead, and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. I pray for a miracle right now in people's lives. Whatever the miracle, Father, it can be even relationships healed right now. Do it in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hi. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, happy Easter, Jonathan. <laughs> Praise God. Um, it's good to see so many of you, and uh, welcome to the house of the Lord. I just want you to, I just feel the, the, the presence of the Lord so strongly. So can we just drink in of his presence, you know? Let's take a decision that we are going to drink in of his presence. And we just want to thank the worship team. And uh, Simon, would you like the worship team up here or you'll call them back? Um, so happy Easter. How many of you did the Easter 12-day challenge? Some, some of it? Okay, so I am happy that you did some of it. How, much, how many of you were blessed by some of it? You know, so I made it a strict rule that my husband had to do it. Okay, so um, that was where, um, you know, like I said, uh, baby, you're going to do it. And, um, and Rakesh did it, and Rakesh was telling me that he was contacting people, you know, like encouragement and stuff, and he had testimonies, and he was so excited. So um, I knew then that revival is coming, okay, at the level of excitement that my husband showed in the activity. So that was my excitement for that. So uh, if you haven't done it, you can still do it and catch up. It, um, I want to honor anyone who's new first time in Capstone Church, uh, or if you're watching online because we've got a strong community, if it's you, if you raise your hand, somebody will come and uh, greet you, meet you. If you're online, uh, the, the online team will say hi, and we'd like to know more about you. So um, welcome. Sunday services here uh, are open now. I think next week, I think we've got an easing of the lockdown, so things should be much easier. We do have um, a, a family who is... Uh, with us in spirit for so long and they've been with us uh, and they've joined us today we'd like to welcome the breaker family so we've got uh joe come on joe and simon over here we've got rebecca ruth uh samuel and daniel um so i'm a good pastor i know my congregation <laughs> i'm just joking so uh, you get their names <laughs> No, no. So praise God. So let's give them a big God bless you. Um, um, and so it's just really great to have you guys here. Uh, we're a really quiet church. <laughs> so um, I really... Um, <laughs> so um, I just don't want to... Um, I just uh, Simon is an amazing man of God, and we've had him here before. I just want to welcome you guys. Say welcome home. You know, and um, I'd like to welcome Simon to come and share the word today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Uh, do you want to stand up? Um, well, stand up whether you want to or not. Just stand up. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for who you are. We honor you. We welcome you. We want to hear from you. We want to connect with you. We want you to touch our hearts and touch our lives. We want to be transformed and we want to be more like you. We want to reveal your glory. We want to be those that you say, well done, good and faithful servant. So help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
we'll go ahead and sit down. Well, hello, family. <laughs> it's um, a strange experience to be in the place that this is the first time I've spoke at Capstone Church as a part of Capstone Church as opposed to a guest. So you're now stuck with us. <laughs> so you must have either got something right or God felt the need to torment you with us. But one way or the other, you've got us. Um, and um, following culture, of course, you can't open without some form of joke or similar. And um, years back, there was something going around the internet, and it was years back, of church notices that went wrong. Did anybody see any of those? And there was one that made me laugh. It said this, it said, this Sunday being Easter Sunday, we're going to ask um, Mrs. Evans to come to the front of the church and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> Couldn't make it up, could you? There was another one It said, um, for those of you who have children and don't know it, for those of you who have children and don't know it, there was another one that said, today we're going to pray for all of those who are sick of our church in our community. <laughs> it's like, I think my favorite one was one that... Um, it was in Leicester, it was on a sign in Leicester against the church, and the sign said this, come this Sunday and find out what hell is like. <laughs> it's just not the way to get people to come through the door of your church. It's just not. It's, uh, yeah, well, we'll move on from there. <laughs> what a peculiar season we've been in. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've been in the place where as a ministry, we've seen more growth in the last 12 months than we have ever seen in our ministry in the last 20 years. And we've been blown away by the way that God has moved. And right at the beginning of the lockdown, the Lord said to me, this is going to be a season like, like Isaac who, who sowed, who, who dug wells and sowed in, in, in famine and caught, saw an enormous harvest. And we have saw God do exactly that We've seen people delivered of demons online. We've seen people meet with the Holy Spirit online. We've seen angels manifest online. It's just been an amazing time. People from Puerto Rico messaging saying, God just came in my house. It's like crazy. How did you even know we were broadcasting? So God bless you, those of you that are watching. And God bless you. It's so nice to be with normal, real people who are not in little boxes. Isn't that exciting? I nearly brought a box with me today because I was feeling a little bit insecure. I thought I might just put it on my head with a little name underneath and then just every now and again drop a flap with connecting. That's a helpful thing. That is a helpful thing. If you make a, a profile picture with a little circle saying connecting, you can dis disconnect from boring Zoom meetings. Not that anybody's ever been involved in one of those, of course. I think the worst story that I've heard from this season is a friend of mine in a city that will remain nameless for the sake of, sake of confidentiality, were holding their church prayer meeting one evening. And <laughs> during the prayer meeting, one of the church members decided it would be a good idea to attend the prayer meeting whilst taking a shower. <laughs> Unfortunately, they'd forgotten to turn off the camera. Thankfully, the camera was not on the shower, but it was on as the dear lady sat in front of the camera, having not yet got dressed. And it caused absolute panic to try and figure out how to close the meeting quickly. So, praise God, we haven't had any of those, have you? I mean, couldn't make that up, could you? Couldn't make it up. I love the fact that, um, you know, I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. I love the fact that the Word of God is living. A dear friend of mine, David Lamb, and a, an evangelist who mentored us in our early, early ministry, he, um, he led a, a Buddhist man to Jesus, actually found the guy living on the streets, if I've got the um, got memory right, and the person came and was living at their house, and he gave them uh, a copy of, of the Bible and they went upstairs and were reading the Bible and the following day he came downstairs and he said this is a strange book and he said David said to him why is that 
He said, because when you read this book, it speaks back to you. And he gave his life to Jesus. And uh, just amazing. And what I love about the Bible and what I love about Revelation is Revelation is progressive. Obviously, truth is fixed. The truth never changes. But our revelation of the truth progresses as we go deeper with him. But our revelation is not only progressive in our relationship with him. Our revelation is geographic and our revelation is seasonal as well. So you can take the same piece of scripture and read it in another city. And because you're in another city, there's revelation you receive because of context. You're understanding me. And then there's the other dynamic of because of season, because of time, whether it be your own personal season or whether it be the season of what God's doing in the church or the nation or on this occasion, the globe, you come back to the Bible and you read the Bible and you read verses of the Bible that have always been there, but because of the season that you're in, there's something fresh breathed upon it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Has it occurred to you? I mean, I'm sure you've all been in it as well. I've lost count how many prophetic meetings I've been in where the words of God's doing a new thing. And when you actually look, it's the old thing with more enthusiasm and not really that new at all. But everybody gets excited for a while. But really, genuinely, we are in this time right now as we begin to move forward that we literally are in a time that is totally nothing like anything that has been previous. And we need our expectations to shift because what can happen is we can step into a new season but live in the new season with the same expectations that we had in the old season. Are you following me? So we need to make sure that our expectation is aligned with what God is saying. I'm going to pick on my son Daniel because he deserves it. Um, we, we like to go fishing. If you're friends with me on Facebook, you will know I like to go fishing. We have fish all over our house, everywhere. And now there's even fish in Daniel's bed. Just fish everywhere. And this year, we joined a different lake. Up to this year, we fished a lake that's only got two fish in it. And it's about nine miles wide. And the odds of you catching a fish is about as lightly as you waking up with a golden egg under your pillow. It's just... The expectation's not high. And bless him, the only fish Daniel caught fell off, unfortunately, which was demoralizing. But the thing was, is a week ago, we went to a new lake. And the stock level in the new lake is totally different to the lake we'd been at previously. And bless him, he walked up to me, he said to me, he said, well, I'm probably going to do some float fishing before we go back, just so I can go back home and say I caught something, even if it's just a small fish. Yeah. You just got some sympathy from your sister. That's a rare thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> revival. But, but, but the thing of it was, here's the thing. His expectations were rooted in the place he'd been previously. And by the time we'd left, he'd actually had two fish. Big fish, which he'd not expected. The point being, it's possible to be in a new season, but living with an old expectation. Are you following me? And something genuinely has shifted. And we're on this moment. We're on this moment where we're stepping out of something and stepping into something. And isn't it interesting? Resurrection Sunday. I mean, it, the thing that fascinates me is as, as a family, we have a number that follows us around. And the number's 2222. And the first time I preached at Holy Trinity, I was sitting with John. Trinity's the church in Leicester we're part of. Um, He said to me, oh, you're going to preach for the first time in November. I said, yeah, it'll be the 22nd. He said, no, no, it's not the 22nd. So it will be the 22nd. He said, just a minute. He says, no, it's not the 22nd. And he went, looked at the calendar and went, would you believe it wasn't the 22nd? And I actually changed it to the 22nd this morning. Do you know, today we're on the 4th of the 4th which is 2222 because it's 44. It's just God just follows us with this stuff and it speaks about the opening of things. 
And he uses this as a way to speak prophetically to us about stuff that God's doing. And I believe that's what God's doing now for us as a family. And when I say us as a family, I don't mean the breakers, I mean capstone. Amen? Amen. So I want to talk to you for a minute. I want to talk to you about what happened in the Gospels. I want you to just go on a little journey with me, and then we will get to the place where we'll move into some ministry. I want you to just think about what happened in the Gospels. So often what can happen is, is because we're familiar with Bible text, we can go, oh, I've read that. But you've never read it now. You've never read it in this moment. And there are things that God wants us to catch from things that we are deeply familiar with because we're reading it in a context that has never been heard before. Do you know that today you released a sound in worship that's never been heard before because this combination of people has never been in this room before and never at this moment before that every time we gather together, there is a new sound that is released if we choose to believe it. There's something we can shift in the spiritual atmosphere that there's a combination of faith that something can shift today that couldn't shift any other day because there's a combination in the room that hasn't been there previously and we've not been in the moment we've been in previously. Are you following me? So we don't want to miss it, do we? We don't want to miss it. So I want you to think about what happened. you got a bunch of fishermen. you got a doctor you've got a tax collector, you've got a high-end legalistic Pharisee who boasted about himself being the best of his people, the, the most obedient to the law when you think of the Apostle Paul. And these guys, they're busy fishing, they're busy doing what tax collectors do, they're busy doing what doctors do, but then there's a moment And this moment set something into motion for three and a half years that they went on a three and a half year journey of the most extraordinary, extreme experience that anybody has probably ever had and ever will. I want you to think about, I mean, what was it about Jesus that he could walk past a a group of guys on a boat and say, follow me, and they just drop what they're doing and do it? He hadn't done any miracles yet. There was nothing that had been manifest yet. But there was something about Jesus that when he looked at these men who were currently engaged with their point of employment, that there was something that they saw in Jesus that caused them to totally disengage from their covenant context and move into something entirely new. And then they set on this journey. I doubt they had any idea what was about to take place. And we read the accounts in the New Testament and we're now so familiar with them that it's so tempting for us just to read it and go, oh yeah, well, that's what happened. But think about it. Here you've got Jesus and the first miracle, they go to a wedding and they sit down in the wedding and the mom, his mom comes up to him and says, they don't have any wine. Now think about this. It says this is the first miracle that Jesus had done. So it wasn't like Mary was going, well, I've seen all the miracles Jesus has done previously, so I know he can sort out this situation. But there was something about the person of Jesus that caused Mary to go, he can sort this situation out. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing that people who've got no experience of believers of the church suddenly look at you and go, I know nothing about you, I've seen nothing that you do, but I know you can sort this situation out. That's what Jesus carried. He then goes into this situation, he says, I want you to go and fill those six clay vessels with water, the washing up bowls, the ceremonial washing. First of all, what were they doing empty? They should have already been full. But he takes these clay vessels and then within minutes, what was water has now been turned to wine. We all know that story, don't we? But listen, gallons of water turned into wine. 
These disciples, these guys that started following Jesus see this miracle. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Can you imagine how extreme that would have been? Can you imagine the wow factor that would have carried with it? I took a group, I take groups of young people out to the Ukraine um, once a year. Obviously, I haven't done the last year, but I remember one occasion we sent out the teams, and what, what I do is I pick the teams and choose the most scared person to lead each team. And then they go off and they do the, um, they do the house groups in the churches. I remember sitting there and they said, oh, are you coming? I said, no, I'm not coming. I'm sending you. Uh, but we don't know what to do. Oh, it's okay, Jesus does. There's only two things you've got to do. First of all, what you say needs to be in the Bible and it needs to be consistent with the Bible. And the other thing is, once you're done, you must minister to the sick. You must do that. They're the only two things. And they went off, knees knocking, <laughs> really seriously. One of them in particular was petrified. And they came back a little bit later that evening and I was waiting back. And they, and they came back and this guy comes in and he said, we prayed for a girl, a lady, who'd had no feeling in her legs. I think it was actually 19 years. I, I don't want to exaggerate, so we'll say 14. It was certainly in double figures. Had no feeling in her legs from the knees down. No feeling at all. And he said, and we prayed for her, and she was healed. And the look of shock on this guy's face that, that it had worked. And this is what happened. This is the level of shock that happened with the disciples with Jesus. Then they go from Jesus doing this, they then go to the temple. And they walk into the temple, and there they are, and it says, and Jesus fashioned a whip. He didn't just pick up a stick. He made a whip. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about what the disciples were thinking while he was doing it? What's this guy doing? And he makes this whip. They've just seen him turn all the water into wine. Then he goes into the temple and he starts turning the tap. Can you imagine? We're following a maniac. What is this guy doing? And then the story carries on and, and he goes into a situation where there's a leper and we read, and he was made whole. We just read, he was made whole. Then you have leprosy, bits go missing. Because you lose the sense of feeling and you can bite the side of your face out without knowing it. And it says, Jesus touched him and he was made whole. There is a creative miracle that parts of a person's body that had been previously missing grew back. Yeah. And we read that, we go, oh, they were made whole. Listen, there is a parts of somebody's body that had been missing that grew back. Think about what the experience of the disciples in that moment would have been. How would that have gone? Then you've got the deal that they, they go across and they come to an area that has been oppressed by somebody that is so demonized that they're naked and they're cutting themselves with rocks. And this thing that's on them is at such a level that it's affected the entire region. And this person runs to Jesus, falls on their knees, says who they are, asks for permission to go into the pigs, and a whole herd of pigs stampede down the hill and go into the sea. What do you think were happening in the disciples' lives in that moment? As they were going on across, as they were on their way across, a massive storm breaks out. The boat's being flung from side to side. Everything in the natural suggested the boat was going to sink to the point that the disciples were literally petrified for their lives. And Jesus just stands up and says, stop it. And it stops. Can you imagine what that would be like? To see that level of authority manifest. Then they go into a situation that Jesus is told, your friend's dead, Lazarus is, is sick, he's dying. And Jesus says, okay, I'll go later. There's no sense of urgency for him at all. And after four days, four days in Hebrew, four, after once you've been dead four days, the soul has left the body. So Jesus waits for four days. When you die, unless you've been embalmed, the moment you die, your stomach acid starts eating through your stomach lining immediately. 
and you start to deteriorate. This is why one of my favorite verses in the Bible, but Lord, he stinketh, (laughs) is there. Because that was the deal. He was there in the tomb. He was stinking. Everybody knew he was dead. And Jesus waits four days, walks into the situation and says, roll away the stone. Can you imagine what was going on in the disciples' minds? What is this guy doing? And they roll the stone away and he goes, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man walks out of a tomb. To the point that the religious leaders of the day are now so angry that they don't only want to kill Jesus, they want to kill Lazarus as well. The fishermen, they've been fishing all night. Jesus comes up to them and says, you not caught anything? No, just put the nets on the other side. They pull the nets up. The nets are so full that they're almost bursting. Three things. You don't put the nets on that side of the boat because the rigging's there. It was totally the wrong place to put the nets, and it was the wrong time of the day to put the nets. They knew that. They were professional fishermen. Jesus steps in to professional fishermen and says, do it like this. And they have so many fish that they have to get other people to help to bring it in. Think about what's going on in these disciples' minds. Think about the emotional high, the way that they were blown away. They must have woke up in the morning going, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Then he takes a couple of them. They go up. This is obviously not in chronological order. They go up onto the mountain. Some didn't notice, but it's okay. They go up onto the mountain, and Jesus stands there, and he's transfigured in glory in front of them. And John, he gets to see it, and he's not allowed to talk about it until 1 John, when he says, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Then he begins with, God is light. He literally saw Jesus glorified. Can you imagine what that would have been like? And then just, you know, just to really bake their noodle, Jesus decides to let them go off in a boat, get halfway across a lake in the midst of contrary winds, and the Lord goes, well, I think I'll go for a walk. We read Jesus walked on water, and we know the story. Listen, Jesus walked on water. Jesus walked. He totally contradicted the natural laws. This was the experience that the disciples had been in. They'd seen it again and again and again. They'd seen Jesus feed thousands with a kid's lunch. Not once, but twice. They saw him walk into the midst of a funeral and raise a boy from the dead. They saw him stand in the temple in the midst of an accusing crowd and a man's withered arm grow back in front of everybody. They saw him deliver the demonized, set the lepers free. They saw blind eyes open, deaf eyes, uh, deaf eyes, that's clever, deaf ears opened, lame people walking. It was Three and a half years of the most extreme, extraordinary life experience that there would have been nothing like it any of them could relate to. Are you following me? It was pretty extreme. To the point that you'd think, they must have got up in the morning going, what's he going to do next? And then he turns around to them and goes, now you go and do it. And he selects 70 of them and they go off. And they come back and they said the demons fled, the sick were healed, the power of God manifest. Can you imagine what emotional state they were in? Can you imagine how high their emotion was? And then they go from probably the most emotional high that anybody could ever have the most extreme experiences of God's glory and presence that the world had ever seen, to then go to the place that they now see this one that had produced all of this go through a level of torment and, 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 and suffering to such a degree that the Scripture tells us that Jesus was so disfigured by the time it was done that he didn't even look human. Can you imagine that 
that that happened to this Jesus that they'd seen walking on water, raising the dead, multiplying. Can you imagine how deep and how steep that drop was? To go from that level of emotional high where they saw God manifest through Jesus at that level to now they're in the place that they have literally seen somebody beaten to such a degree that now, as Isaiah states, people could not hold gaze with him because of how disfigured he was. Can you imagine what emotional state the disciples must have been in. We know from what happened in the, um, on the road to Emmaus, we know that the disciples have most definitely not understood that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. And what did they do? What happened? How did they respond to this extreme situation? How did they go from this place where they, they, they saw these extreme miracles and now they saw this extreme, extraordinary, unparalleled level of torment expressed to somebody that they'd become deeply in love with. That Peter had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But now they're in the place that the one that Peter had said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, was now dead. Can you for a moment imagine how they were emotionally? John 20, 19 says this, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, the doors were locked. They had been with Jesus for three and a half years. They'd seen the dead raised, they'd seen... The, the elements contradicted. They'd seen demons cast out, the lame walk. They'd seen food multiplied. They'd seen storms stopped. They'd seen the most extraordinary things. And yet, now, they're hiding, locked up in a room. This is what trauma will do to you. Trauma will rob you of your destiny if you allow it to. That's what trauma does. It, it causes you to go into a survival mentality that it's almost like everything that's happened previously is now irrelevant and now all you need to do is just survive. That is what state our nation is in. Trauma has driven people into the place that they're emotionally locked up, psychologically locked up, financially locked up. But God's got a solution. God has got a solution. And in verse 20, 21, what year is it? What a coincidence. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. And with, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus has got the solution to every form of lockdown that ever existed and ever will exist. And the solution is this. The Prince of Peace, moving beyond simply being with you to the Prince of Peace inhabiting you you see they'd stood in the presence of Jesus and they'd seen what Jesus did but now in this moment there's a transition happens they move from the place where they've been with Jesus to now suddenly the Holy Spirit comes and he possesses them there is a shift in mentality suddenly he says peace be with you. Peace is not something you enter. Peace is now the position you occupy. And he says to them, from this position of peace, what is the peace? It's the shalom. It is the perfect peace. It's the absence of all wickedness. It's the absence of all terror. They carried the answer with inside of them. They were possessed by the Prince of Peace. 
That's why Romans says, the God of peace shall crush Satan beneath your feet. Why? Because the God of peace is not with you alone. The God of peace has come and made his home inside of you. You carry the power of God in the earth. You literally carry heaven on earth. Come on. Jesus' answer to the disciples' lockdown was to give them the key. And the key was the inhabiting presence of God. He breathed on them. You see, there is an anointing in this season. There is a release of the presence of God in this season that God is going to release on the church. And he's going to release the church into the nations in this next season with a different authority and a different anointing that you will be sent in a way that you've never been sent before. I know you're not quiet. I feel like I won't say that. (laughs) See, there has to be a possession of this. You have to possess it. You have to possess it. It has to become a part of you. You have to begin to say, the nearness of God, the inhabiting of God has taken a hold of me. And I have the keys that's going to unlock this nation and the nations in the next season. That there is an anointing that is hanging in the atmosphere for anyone who asks. Rakesh said it earlier, my God shall meet all of my needs according to his riches in glory. You see, it's not just enough to have the presence of God. You need to be transformed by it. Adam and Eve were in the presence of God. Judas was in the presence of God. And Lucifer was in the presence of God. None of them were transformed by it. Because what they did is they were in it, but they didn't allow it to impregnate them to the point that it brought about transformation. And what happened with the disciples? They walked with Jesus in this experience, extraordinary experience. But then when it came down to it, even though they'd been in the midst of it, they hadn't allowed it to go beyond the surface to the point that it penetrated them, that it transformed them. I reckon that's why God's done what he's done. When I was in um, Glasgow in February of 20, 2019, 2020, sorry, I didn't actually know this was a prophetic word when I said it. I was there with Emma Stark up in Glasgow, and I said, when I was praying this morning, the Lord said this to me, if I take away your conferences and I take away your meetings, will you still be burning for me? A month later, we did. This season's done two things. It's exposed those that are lukewarm and it's brought to light those that are burning. Which one are you? That was not a rhetorical question. Which one are you? Are you the one that's saying, I'm just waiting for everything to get back to normal so that we can stand in rows again? If standing in rows was going to transform nations, it would have happened a long time ago. Jesus didn't come and say, stay and stand in rows. He said, go as the Father sends me. Now I'm sending you. There is a commissioning from heaven. There is an anointing from heaven for you to break the depression off of people. For you to break the oppression off of people. For you to break despair off of people. We exist for the binding up of the broken hearted. The setting free of the captives. The liberating of the prisoners. The healing of the sick. The raising of the dead. This is the church's greatest hour. Oh, good. And the Lord just goes, okay, we'll get them ready. What are you going to do? I'm going to make every one of them a worship leader. Okay. I'm going to make every one of them a service leader. I'm going to make every one of them responsible for the presence of God personally. Well, how are you going to do that, Lord? I'm going to put them in their houses where they're always meant to be doing it. And I'm going to allow circumstances to develop to the place that every household that has the name of Jesus above it becomes an altar where the presence of God begins to manifest. How are you coming out of lockdown? Are you coming out of lockdown going, oh, thank God that's over with. I'm so glad I survived. 
Or are you coming out of lockdown like my dog? He's a Westie, but he thinks he's a Rottweiler. And I take him out, and I'm walking with him in the park, and a squirrel goes past, goes, squirrel, squirrel. And he can actually be fast asleep in the lounge. And you go, squirrel, and he's like, where? And he's up immediately. Are you like that? Is that what you like? Are you in that place where God says miracle, and you're like, where? Which says opportunity, where? Or are you in the place of going, well... There were no fish in the lake when I looked last. So it's probably going to be the same now. We've been sitting in the dark night of the soul. Singing, I'm all alone. There's no one here beside me. Has that been your song yesterday? All my troubles seem so far away. Or are you coming out of this season with, I've got the victor living in me. He's taking me from glory to glory. He's taking me from victory to victory. There's a lion inside of you that's saying, I know there's a squirrel and I'm going to have him. The thing about demonic, demonic oppression is what happens is it's not like, it doesn't just come in one great dollop. It comes in layers. And some of you have grown cold and you don't even know it's happened. Because it doesn't happen overnight. You just read your Bible a little bit less, prayed a little bit less, looked up Facebook a little bit more during the live stream, sitting eating your sandwich. Past the priest, he's going, let's worship the Lord. You're going... Oh man, I don't like this sermon, let me mute it. <laughs> I know none of you did that, but they just, some other people probably did, but not you. You see, the dynamic of it is this in this time, that there's just been these blankets that have got on some, and today God wants to shake them off, and God wants to, I mean, what's this? You all need to be quiet. That's a demon if there ever was one. It doesn't say God arises in a whisper. It says God arises in a shout. And there needs to be that shout that comes out of you. There needs to be that shout that comes out of your spirit that breaks the chains and releases the presence of God. Amen. Let's have the worship team come up. It is nice to preach a sermon rather than a sermonette. Sermonettes produce Christianettes. I trust we don't have any Christianettes in the room. If you do, you can get delivered before you leave today. So I would love you to just stand up, if you would. Any area in your life where there is lockdown, whether it be lockdown of expectation or disappointment, or the trauma of what you've seen in the last season, Jesus' solution to trauma is this. <sighs> Receive my spirit. That's his solution. It's not come to nine years of counseling. <laughs> Praise God for counselors, seriously. But counseling's not going to bring you into freedom. The Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is. So why not bypass that and just come straight into the encounter? So just hold your hands up to him. You know, we sang that song, yeah, Yeshua. You got to go to Brazil and hear that song. And ju 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 just, just stand in the midst of it in, in Fortaleza and, 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 and just in the midst of probably some of the most wicked stuff that's going on. I won't detail because there's children, but let me say to you, think of wicked at its worst possible scenario, and they're seeing it, but in the midst of it, God's presence is breaking out. You see, God is attracted to darkness. 
God is attracted to darkness. Demons are Jesus' food. Sickness is Jesus' food. It's what he purchased on the cross. You've got no right to hold on to depression because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. So, Father, we come to you and we just worship you and we open our hearts to you and we declare that in this season we refuse to come out of this unchanged we refuse to come out of this chained we refuse to come out of this with our hopes destroyed and our dreams destroyed we refuse to do that but we step out of all of that stuff right now and we step into the place of hope. So just do that right now by faith. Step into that right now. Shibari sinemondo kiatie, yembre siti babuti sin karapatuma. Come on, pray in the spirit. Ribasinanda ridike sinamakora. Ribasi di babodi sin bambandi. Remende sikiri batu sinemafranda. You see, there is a spiritual space every moment, every day. And in those moments, what you have to do is you have to step into that moment and allow your spirit to expand into the moment. That tongues is not I'm just trying to survive but you allow your spirit to expand into the new space so pray, 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 pray and fill the atmosphere Hallelujah. Now just lift your hands to Jesus. And just say this, Father God, forgive me where I've aligned myself with lies. Where I've allowed the trauma to rob me of my destiny. I break that agreement now. Do you know the scripture says it restores the years that the locusts have eaten. And today is Resurrection Sunday. So everything that's been stolen from you will be restored in Jesus' name. So right now, receive it right now. Where there has been lack, we receive abundance. Where there has been bondage, we receive freedom. Where there has been depression, we receive joy. Where there's been hopelessness, we begin to dream again. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's just sing his name. And as you sing his name, welcome him in. Welcome him in. Amen. So just lift your hands to him. Yes.
over the years that the locusts have eaten one. Restore the years, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you remove every dam that the enemy has built, Father. Every hindrance to the free flow. I command it to be moved in the name of Jesus. And I declare the restoration right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I declare the restoration of the years that the locusts have eaten. I call back, I call back that which has been stolen and I call a replenishment seven times of that which has been stolen in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Everything that is dead, I declare alive, 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 alive. a new season, Lord. Let them not look back to the old seasons they have, Lord. And the old things which have, Lord, has, Lord, has moved away from their lives, Lord. And we declare new blessings, Lord. New things, Lord. New ceilings for them, Lord. Lord, we pray a prayer of blessing, Lord. And we release them, Lord, to greater things, Lord. And we welcome them, Lord, to our family, Lord. We pray for an increase in everything they do, Lord. We pray for them. Lord, a newness in their life, Lord. We bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name, we release God's blessing, honor into their lives, Lord. Amen. Rahele sokili le pasia. Roma sikini na baba sekulia Roma sikini ni sukini ada bakeli Rom sikini asarosa ka Shombre ni moko kol kor 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 rok 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 haleluya haleluya so grace haleluya so glory in the presence of God so rock of ages rock of ages so Signs these days, the Lord shall follow them. Signs and wonders and miracles wherever they minister, wherever they move forth, O Lord. In the days ahead, O Lord. Hallelujah. Amazing signs and miracles to testify the power of the living God as they serve wholeheartedly and move forward, trusting, holding on, fixed and rooted on the rock of ages tokia bagasi kibo yiga basta kala braconia namas tokin mana plokosi ki dus kabar sort kala ragasta staba stikini ni sukini ama blaze blaze fire of god blaze blaze sukara namasekinia light now light now light now light now 
glory of God, glory of God, will, 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 will rain on them, O oh Lord. Pray that, hallelujah, showers of blessing, rain on the family, Lord. Showers of blessing, rain on them, rain on them, rain on them, in the name of Jesus. Stretch your hands towards them and let's sing fire, fire, fire. Fire, fire, fire. Oh, stretch your hands towards them. Fire, fire. church should lift up their hands to the Lord. You know, one thing that struck me that Simon said was, he said his dog is a Westie who thinks it's a Rottweiler. I met Dell's dog, who's a Rottweiler who thinks he's a Westie. Some of us are Rottweilers in the spirit. And trauma and things that have happened, the enemy has affected our identity. And may that be lifted off in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Come on. You know, and as we are celebrating Resurrection Sunday, one thing we're going to look into is in this season, we're going to step into the next 40 days, we're going to step into Pentecost. We're going to step into a season that we are, and we as a church haven't done this, where we're going to now ask for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And let it begin with us. Let it begin with us. And then let it go into the nation and to the nations. So come on, let's lift up our hands. Can someone just tell me when Pentecost still Sunday? So you are allowed to look at your phone for a minute. Someone briefly just Google when Pentecost Sunday is.
some evangelism bags left over there and the uh the bags for you guys if you we were unable to drop it off at your house i do apologize um some of you change your phone number so there you go okay um and um so if you've not received your bag please help yourself to a bag uh is there any other announcements that i need to make we've got prayer on tuesday and uh, we're going to go into season for the Pentecost. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Joe. And thank you for bringing the word. Come on, let's give everybody a big God bless you.